ओके गुड इवनिंग वन एंड ऑल वी वेलकम यू टू दिस स्पेशल सेशन ऑन लो विजन आई वुड टेक दिस ऑपरचुनिटी टू इंट्रोड्यूस आर टूडेज मॉडरेटर आर टूडेज मॉडरेटर इज अ फैकल्टी एंड अ सीनियर ऑप्टोमेट्रिस्ट फ्रॉम स्कूल ऑफ ऑप्टोमेट्री रीजनल इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ ऑफ्थमोलॉजी एंड गवर्नमेंट ऑफ दलमिक हॉस्पिटल एगमो चेन्नई ही हेज डन इज ऑप्टोमेट्री इन दर नाइनटीन एटी टू from rio goh and joined government service he has 37 long years of experience as an optometrist and had many opportunities to examine the vvips of our country he has trained over 1200 optometrist students at rio goh and his students are spread it across the length and breadth of tamil nadu and pondicherry some of the students are working even in gulf countries and few of them are managing the big optical chains in india and abroad his special interest on contact lenses enabled him to make a virtual center for a resource center for aical at rao goh he is the founding member founding executive member of optometry association of tamil nadu anbargal past president of asoa alumni school of optometry association present general secretary of tamil nadu government optometrists association on behalf of oatn with this note i take this opportunity to invite our senior optom mr kannagaran sir to moderate today's session sir it is yours now thank you thank you kumaran sir good evening welcome to our optometric association of tamil nanbargal i teach webinar program socrates said the secret of change is to focus all of your energy not on fighting the old but on building the new today we are here to learn something new and update our knowledge in the field of optometry our topic today is understanding pediatric low vision before i introduce our speaker i would like to thank the oatn organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to moderate today's session and let's go over some instructions kindly fill the registration form and feedback form to get the oci credit points Hello. Hello. Go ahead. I request the audience. I request the audience to type all your questions in the chat box, which will be addressed at the end of the session of the speech. Our speaker today is Dr. R. P. Ganga Karta. She did her bachelor's of optometry at Elite School of Optometry in the year 1998 to 2002, and her project was on development trends in virgin specialty. And she completed master of philosophy, vision rehabilitation from 2003 to 2005. And her thesis is on the effect of different types of cost lighting on. Reading performances in patients with retinitis pigmentosa. She did the Doctor of Philosophy, Pediatric Low Vision Rehabilitation at Queensland University of Technology, Australia, from 2006 to 2010. Her PhD thesis, the effect of prolonged reading on reading performances and visual function students with low vision. She completed National Board of Exam Optometry Part One and Part Two in August 2003, and National Board of Examiners in Optometry Treatment and Management of Optic Diseases in April 2015. In September 
she got a fellowship in neuro optometric rehabilitation association from 2018 she is working as a post doctorate research fellow in low vision her post doctorate research includes function vision in people with ultra low vision and prosthetic vision and currently she is working as post doctorate research fellow ultra low vision clinic department of ophthalmology school of medicine wilmer i institute john hopkins university baltimore maryland she has vast experience in research and clinical trials she participated in many conferences and presented scientific papers she published more than 10 research papers she is the apt person for this presentation let us welcome dr arti karta to enlighten us on pediatric low vision over to dr arti thank you so much for the wonderful introduction uh, I, i feel really great to be back here and meet all of you at least uh, virtually um and i hope you all are staying safe let me uh, you can hear me well i hope right yes yes okay so i'm yes, going to share I, i'm going to share my screen the geo Can you see that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, um, like uh, uh, optometrist Karnagaran mentioned in the introduction, um, I'm talk going to talk about understanding pediatric low vision. That is my topic. So, um, to understand anything, we need to know what it is. so this is a definition that i would like to use for today's purpose uh, because low vision can be defined in many ways but uh, you know this is this is a functional definition i would like to use today so a child with low vision is defined as an individual who is less than uh, 16 years of age having best corrected um, visual acuity between 618 and 360 in the better eye and who requires special education and continuing eye care to prevent for the deterioration of their condition so um we understand two things one is that uh it is it is for children under 16 years of age and they have a significant visual impairment and can range between 618 to 360 and another important factor here that you can see in the definition is that they also require special education and continuing eye care which is what i want to emphasize for the rest of the presentation um so just to discuss the prevalence of uh, low vision in children in india uh, it is about 0.75 in 1000 that is about 3 million children uh this is from stats report in 2002 so this could this could be different now but this is what is available currently so we know that uh, uh children with low vision they are widely outnumbered by adults with low vision uh they are far less um so we don't we don't hear much about children with low vision because the numbers are much less but what does that say so even though it is less than 5% of the entire visually impaired population when we look at the impact we have to consider the disability adjusted life years which means that the number of years that they live with this visual impairment so we know that most of the children who have low vision they are born with the condition so uh, it is a lifelong of visual impairment and then uh, if we adjust for this factor which is the visually impaired years then the prevalence comes pretty close to 20% uh it it goes up from 5% and after this the 20% is pretty close it is it is only second to the prevalence of cataract so that gives you an idea about uh the impact of this problem uh, so it is quite significant um even though the numbers might look less so that's what i wanted to say now coming to the causes of visual impairment in children um these causes are uh, changing because currently we see a lot more uh, children with cortical visual impairment compared to the other conditions in the past which was uh, retinal conditions or albinism or um, retinopathy of prematurity or other conditions 
the cortical visual impairment is uh, becoming more these days because uh, there are more survival rates from high-risk pregnancies or preterm births. Uh, the survival rates are high, and then we see uh, children with the consequences, which is one of them is cortical visual impairment. And then the other conditions are optic nerve hypoplasia, albinism, and retinal degenerations that we also see. So depending on the region and the part of the world that you are in, uh, the conditions that you see might be different. Some areas have more of certain conditions and uh, some areas have more of other conditions. So especially in the Western world, it's mostly uh, cortical visual impairment and children with multiple disabilities. And in India, we still might be seeing uh, more of retinal degenerations, but the number of uh, consanguineous marriages and other uh, issues that we had in the past, it's, it's going down much, uh, much more uh, these days than in the past. So it is changing. So uh, when it comes to the impact of low vision in children, we cannot just see them as miniature adults. Uh, they are not just uh, you know, little adults that you see with low vision. They are mostly children. First, first thing is that they're children. And we know that it impacts their learning and education because they are still um, under development. And uh, everything, most of, the, most of the things that they learn in childhood, at least 85% 85, 85 of learning happens through uh, vision. So any impairment in vision has a huge impact on learning and education. And also, um, and at that age, when you're young, uh, even when you're older, but especially in young children, when they're learning to uh, uh, understand expressions and emotions, uh, that is a nonverbal communication. It becomes, it's mostly visual and it becomes difficult. So that makes social interactions uh, very challenging for them. Um, so they, they don't know whether the per person is smiling or you know the expressions are not clear. So they're still learning about these things and it can be very hard for them. Um, another thing is they're more sensitive to environmental changes, uh, like changes in color or lighting, more, more sensitive to glare or uh, you know, other changes in the environment. That makes it difficult for them to uh, learn orientation and mobility and also safely navigate in new environments. So that, that is another impact. And then um, last but not the least, uh, they also uh, have um, issues in uh, uh, being treated differently from their peers uh, for, compared to children with normal vision. Children with uh, visual impairment are treated differently. And then sometimes, uh, you know, some studies have shown that they, are, they have issues because they are overprotected by their parents and teachers because you want to keep them safe. So emotionally, there is an impact as well uh, because they feel different. And our, our goal mainly is to uh, develop a program that can make them get integrated with the normal uh, uh, children and then make their life as normal as possible. So that is the idea. So um, this is a proposed uh, way of looking at visual disability in children. It is, it is a ideal thing, but uh, not, not completely in practice, but this is a good way to follow it. One is um, looking at communication, like I said. Um, so we, we can look at uh, the effect of high contrast or uh, bringing things closer to them. Like, you know, when you're communicating with them, maybe you want to come closer um, initially when they are learning about faces and uh, people. And also one way of looking at it is like, for example, having photographs which are tactile um, or, you know, expressions to teach them like smile and different expressions in a tactile way. Another way is orientation and mobility. So uh, mainly uh, talking about other senses. So we want to uh, achieve a functional goal by integrating different senses together because focusing just on vision might not help them completely. So that's another area which we could focus on. Another one is activities of daily life, which is mainly school performance in children when you look at them. And this is mostly, when you talk about it, it's mostly sustained reading performance, which is reading at normal distance. So these are the broad areas which you can look at when you look at visual disability in children. Um, one of the main areas uh, that we need to consider is functional vision. So functional vision is uh, how they perform in our daily life. Um, it is different from visual function in that visual functions are the function that we measure in the clinic, like visual acuity 
or contrast sensitivity or visual fields, but functional vision is the aspect of vision that uh, tells us how they perform in real life. So uh, they have difficulty. There are very few studies uh, that focus on children, but one of the few studies is uh, the questionnaire development of the questionnaire, which is a LV Prasad visual function questionnaire, which looked at uh, difficulty in detail-oriented tasks that children had. Um, they reported problems with reading at arm's length, uh, seeing bus numbers, reading blackboard, or you know things like threading a needle, which are all very detail-oriented tasks. So these are some of the functional aspects that we know of. Um, so in the 1960s, now going back a little bit in history, how it all began. So the rehabilitation that we know currently, uh, we know that we are uh, trying to promote uh, use of residual vision. So that is whenever you talk about low vision, we are talking about uh, promoting the use of residual vision. So that comes naturally, but there was a point when it was not that way. So it all began in the 1960s. So before that, all the effort was put into a uh, saving sight. So people believed that using vision can harm their vision and then further cause further decrease in vision. So that changed mainly in the 1960s after this person, her name is Natalie Baraga. She's the one who uh, advocated for sight enhancement mainly in children. Uh, she's, she's one of the main personalities that brought this up. And she developed different uh, scales. One is uh, two well-known things, which is well uh, known after her, which is the Baraga Visual Efficiency Program, and also uh, Baraga Visual Efficiency Evaluation. So this is when it all started. And she, with this tool that she developed, she could actually show that uh, when you attend, when you promote the use of residual vision, children showed increased visual behavior. They improved in reading, they improved in their classroom performance and, you know, the other aspects of life. So she's the one who actually uh, proved that. And then that, that is what we use currently and we take it as a norm, but it was not like that at one point. So it's, it's good to acknowledge the person who started it all, especially in the field of pediatric low vision. So now, th since I told that one of the main uh, causes of low vision in children is cortical visual impairment, I would like to start with that uh, because it's slightly different from the other causes of low vision in that, um, so the main uh, reason for cortical visual impairment, it's a permanent or temporal loss of vision from damage to posterior visual pathways or occipital cortex. And it's mostly common because of high, so like I mentioned, uh, more survival rates these days. Um, and it can be from developmental brain defects or uh, uh, infection uh, at birth or perinatal hypoxia, uh, ischemia, or shaken baby syndrome, which is a case of uh, abusive uh, ch child abuse. So um, in this case, you can see when you examine the patient, uh, you will see that the ocular structures are intact. There is probably nothing wrong with them. And then if, if it is a a mild case of cortical visual impairment, it is very, very hard to diagnose it. Um, so we need other techniques like imaging and things like that to come up with that conclusion because very often these children are taken that they're not motivated or they're malingering. And it's, it's very hard to say what is happening when you see a mild case because practically when you look at them, there is nothing wrong with them. But at the same time, they have huge problems in processing visual information. So um, it, it is a very tricky way uh, to assess the, these children. So it's very different compared to other cases like star guards or retinal degeneration, where you know there is a defect in the eye and you can actually show that. Um, so uh, here it is different. So what you see with these children is mainly that their vision fluctuates, you know, sometimes uh, between days or even within minutes, like it fluctuates a lot, uh, it changes. And then they also experience crowding. So uh, when you have a cluttered environment or you know, like even when you're measuring vision uh, or they're reading, if, if there are too many things, like you know, the interaction between different letters on the chart, it can affect their performance. So they might go closer, like read one letter at a time or one word at a time. So clutter is something. And also environmentally, uh, if you have too many things, or uh, they, you have loud noises and you know bright lights and things like that around them, it affects them. So they're very, very sensitive to those things. 
uh, and they can be overstimulated. So it is very hard to like, one of the main reasons why their performance changes is because they're either very overstimulated or they're understimulated. So if you overstimulate, they kind of fall asleep or they stop responding altogether. And if you don't stimulate them enough, then you don't get a response either. So it is, it is that finding the sweet spot there that you know you have to find the right type of stimulus and it varies between children as well. And it varies between times that you assess them. So sometimes it takes more than one session to really get a grasp of what these children are going through. So um, that's something that we have to keep in mind when you look at these children. And you, there are some mannerisms, which is also called blindism. So you can see that behaviors like eye poking or head banging, or these could be uh, people who, who are aversive to light. They might look away from light or being very sensitive to light or the opposite, they might be light gazers. So you can see extreme behavior sometimes. And uh, you know there is no particular treatment for this as such, uh, but it might change with age. You know, As they mature, it, these things can change, but these are some of the things that com you can commonly see in them. And another thing with these children is that they have problems with central vision. Their peripheral vision is mostly retained. So sometimes uh, when you actually bring a target, they might, as, as they get closer to it, you might see them looking away from it. And they're not actually trying to look away from it, but they're trying to use their peripheral vision to uh, understand what it is. So, you know, their fixations are different. And one thing that helps is that if there is movement of the stimulus, so it's easier to see and understand shapes and forms when it's moving. Suppose like you see a flat, square on the on the screen and ask them to identify the shape it might be difficult for them to actually tell you the shape but if it's moving uh, you show them a moving cube it's a, it might be a little easier for them and like i mentioned every child is different so they instead of like just even if you get a diagnosis as cortical visual impairment you cannot proceed based on that diagnosis you have to have individual functional evaluation for them because every child is different and their levels are different. So you need to start at different points for different children. So that's another thing that uh, you need to keep in mind with these children. So broadly, uh, low vision assessment, it's, it's, there are some common elements between adults and children. So you always start with a detailed history. In this case, you need to know about their milestones, developmental milestones and previous low vision evaluations. Uh, and also previous use of low vision devices. So uh, have they been prescribed anything or how are they already using something and what are the strategies that they currently have in use? And obviously visual acuity. So in children, uh, it might be difficult depending on their age. So it's very important to use um, age appropriate tools. So um, very young children, you might want to use a preferential looking test like a grating pattern. Or if, if they are preschool, then you might use pictures like uh, Dad and Leah chart where you have, you know, very common objects like Apple, house, and you're familiar with that. So, and more older group, you can use uh, letters like a Bailey Levy chart or uh, a letter chart. And then another uh, function that is important is contrast sensitivity. So uh, there are specific tests developed for children. One is uh, hiding Heidi. There are other uh, tests as well, which are uh, mostly like picture based. So it's easier for them to uh, pay attention to. And color vision is important as well. Uh, and in most cases, they have reasonably good color vision, um, unless like they have very advanced stages of a disease, but most of them they have, like in the young days, they have reasonably good color vision. So you can use uh, Ishihara or uh, Jumbo D15 plate. Uh, the other aspects of it, which are not commonly used with adults, th these are the two tests that are important for children, which I will come to in a little bit. That is ocular motility. So it's, it's important to check their fixations like saccades and pursuits, and also binocular vision. So um, doing a cover test or um, a Hirschberg test to see if they have any uh, 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 deviations and also uh, measuring their accommodation and convergence. These are important when it comes to children. And um, another important aspect is reading performance. So um, even though I mentioned visual acuity, so visual acuity is, uh, is a very good measure and it is highly correlated with uh, reading performance, but measuring visual acuity is not 
uh, enough to prescribe for reading. So that is something I want to emphasize in the, in the coming slides as well. So one of, uh, one of the measures that you could do is reading performance using words, sentences, or paragraphs. So that again, depends on the age of the child. And uh, another thing, uh, it's good to know what to expect when you're examining uh, these children. So most of the, some, most of, some of the refractive errors that is associated with the most common conditions. Um, uh, with albinism, you can expect moderate to high hyperopia or myopia with uh, high, uh, with the role astigmatism. Uh, in cerebral palsy also moderate to high hyperopia, microphthalmos moderate to high hyperopia. Um, in nystagmus, especially pendulum nystagmus is moderate with the role astigmatism. And in Down syndrome and ROP cases, you see myopia and also cataracts, you see myopic shift. So it's good to have uh, an idea about what you can expect, uh, you know, when you're looking at a child in terms of their refraction. So uh, you get an idea about what prescription you're going to come up with. So since I mentioned uh, earlier about measuring visual disability, I was talking about school performance. So one of the uh, important aspects of uh, approaching children with low vision is uh, to improve their uh, classroom performance. So if you look at the type of tasks that happens in the classroom, this is a study that reported uh, the total time spent at different distances by children. Um, so you can see here, distance work is about 25%, which is like about one hour, 10 minutes of the entire classroom uh, performance. Near to distance, that is uh, copying things from the board and you know, like shifting between near to distance is about less than an hour. Whereas near point work, like reading takes most of the time, like more than half of the time is spent on reading. Uh, that is part of their school work. So this is good to know because they spend most of the time in school and it is important to know because when we are working with adults, you know that we always uh, ask about their job, like what kind of work they do. And you know the goals of uh, low vision rehabilitation is based on their you know, employment and their daily life goals. Whereas in children, you know that the most important thing is education and school performance. And that is the most amount of time that they are uh, spent on. So, and in that, it's important to know what is the distance that they work on. So this is, this is important for us as optometrists. So uh, it's good to know that more than half of the time is spent on near work. And when you uh, talk about the duration of each task at different distances, you can see that, uh, you know, on an average, like at a, at a point in time, they spend about seven and a half minutes for distance work. And, um, near to distance is about six minutes and near work is about 16 minutes, like 16 to 17 minutes. So this is continuously at a time, uh, the amount of time that they spend on each task. So again, near work is something that they do for a longer period of time. Even like, you know, if you take at every point in time, near work constitutes more time in their daily life. So near work is obviously reading, mostly about, you know, learning things and reading. So um, most of my work, my background with children is also on reading. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So when you talk about reading, uh, there are different types of reading. So, uh, you know, you, for example, you read a menu in the restaurant and uh, you look for uh, telephone numbers in your phone or telephone directory or, you know, things like that. Or you look for a specific number, like you're looking for a contact or anything like that. That is also reading. And then when you're reading a storybook or a newspaper, that is also reading. And when you're reading your textbook, like uh, you're reading for an exam, that is also reading. And finally, like uh, when you are appearing for an exam, you want to memorize things. Uh, you know, you have, you have your math exam, you want to remember the formula and things like that. So you're reading the formula. So that is also reading. But these are all different types of reading. They are not all the same. So reading a menu is very different from reading a story is very different from reading your textbook. So it's, it's like it's known, but we usually don't think about it that way when we talk about reading. Uh, it's just reading. So when somebody comes to the office and complains about reading, you think like, okay, yeah, as I know reading. And most of the time, what we are thinking about is reading a newspaper or, uh, you know, like a storybook, a prolonged reading thing. So that is the most common form of reading that we usually associate the uh, term reading with. 
And that type of reading is actually called reading for comprehension because we are reading for understanding things. Uh, when, you're, when you're reading a general text, you're reading so that you understand what is the matter. Um, and that form of reading is actually called rodding because it is a combination. You're also talking in your mind about the words that you're reading. So it's a combination of reading and ording because you're also hearing what you're reading. So that is why it's called rodding. These terms were coined by a person called Carver. So he did extensive research on reading. And then he called these terms different gears of reading. So just like you have different gears when you're driving, you know, you're driving on a slope is different from you driving on flat ground versus you are, you know, climbing up a hill, right? Your, your speeds are different, obviously. So it's the reading performance is also analogous to that you reading a uh, short material or you're going to a store and then you're reading the label of something that you want to buy that's like a very you know quick like you want to just skim through and then read and then quickly buy the stuff that is different and that's like the lowest gear so to do that type of reading you don't need a very good reading speed you just need to read like you know uh, 50 words per minute for doing that kind of thing you just need to know the name of the object whereas when you're reading a uh, longer time you need to have good speeds because if you read very slow, then you take like ages to finish one paragraph and that's not ideal. Uh, and then that you will give up at some point. So you need like certain amount of speed to maintain normal reading. That is about 200 to 250 words per minute in an adult. And for children, it changes with age. So when they are very young, it is, it is much less. And they, as they develop more reading skills, it improves with age. So that's one thing that you will see when you are uh, seeing children. Uh, you expect as you keep following them up through the years, you see that their reading improves with age. And that is nothing to do with, you know, like intervention. It is like by itself, uh, it's a part of the child's development. So that is something to be expected. Uh, that is about, they improve about uh, 10 uh, words per minute for low vision uh, children. And in normal children, the gain is about 14 words per minute. Uh, every year that is how much they gain so if you are following up children and then you see anything within that then you could say that it is part of normal development and not something what you did it's not because of your prescription or it's not because of your intervention it's just part of normal development and another thing that affects reading is the difficulty level of reading material so um the more difficult the material is, the more uh, uh, the less the reading speed. So you take more time to read. So uh, a material which has more difficult words or longer words, it you take more time to read it than uh, you know easy material, like uh, you know comics and things like that. You know you can finish it quickly compared to you reading uh, you know your textbook, which which has more complex words and you're spending more time to read each of them. It takes uh, more time. And also reading age is another factor. So this is different from the chronological age. So a 12-year-old 12, 12 child, that is his chronological age, but the reading age could be different. He might be reading at the level of an eight-year-old. So it's important to know what is the reading age versus the actual chronological age, because if it is not matching, then it shows that there is poor reading development and which affects their school performance. So these are the, some of the things that you have to keep in mind when you are actually doing a, an intervention for improving their reading. So uh, talking about reading development, uh, there, is, there is a table here that shows different stages of uh, development. And then uh, I have also put the reading rates from Carver that uh, is useful to know at each level. So stage zero is age zero to six, where it's called pre-reading. They mostly look at pictures and you know it's mostly picture books, not words. And, uh, you know, like, uh, e even if it is words, like it is apple, cat, dog, and that kind of thing. So it is, you know, about 68 words per minute is their reading speed. And stage one, that is what is to be expected, that is in normal vision. Uh, stage one is six to seven years where the formal training, you know, they start to uh, go to kindergarten or, you know, early years where they have a training in letters and combinations and things like that. Uh, that is about 99 words per minute. That is that age reading speed. So the, these stages that I'm talking about is the stage of learning to read. So they, they haven't learned to read yet. So they're learning to read. That is the space. Um, and 
that ends between seven to eight years uh, where they have now learned to read whole word patterns and they have fluent reading. So they can read uh, you know, individual words fluently. And at that point, their reading rate is about 121 to 141 words per minute. Um, and after that, they mostly from age eight onwards, reading happens to learn. It's, it's the other way around. They're reading to learn things. So, you know, more comprehension. And uh, when you're reading material, like about 15 to 17 years, uh, when you're reading a material, you're not just reading words, but you're also having multiple perspectives about what you're reading. Like, for example, you're reading a story. You're not just reading words and understanding only those. You're also having, you know, your own imagination. Uh, those words have different meanings to different people. So it is at that age that they form all that. And 18 and above, it's college years where they have more mature reading. And at that point, the reading rate is about 263. So you can see uh, how the reading rate goes up with age. And there are different stages of reading. So uh, in children with low vision, what happens is that initial years where they have, uh, you know, pre-reading and learning to read phase, it's mostly through speech because, you know, you're telling them the words like as parents or teachers, you're telling them, you know, this is this, and then you're teaching them through speech. So you can see that that phase of it is mostly normal for them. They, they develop normally at that point because it's not just visual. It's also more, more to do with speech. But it's only after that, you know, from stage three onwards, where they start to read to learn, that is when you start to see more impact of visual impairment, because then they have to uh, keep at it. You know, they have to read for longer periods of time. They have to understand the text and also maintain the speed. That is when the low vision kicks in. That is when you see more of the impact. So, and then what I have mentioned here, this SWPM uh, is standard words per minute which is slightly different from words per minute because uh, a standard word is six letters in length. So uh, when, you, when you actually take any material, uh, you know, like for example, a newspaper page, you can see that the words have different lengths. And then how you convert that into standard words per minute is by dividing by six, then it will equate all the difficulty levels. So by doing that, then you can actually kind of make the words uniform in a page and that is another way to measure reading. And that's uh, mostly used for research, but you know, otherwise reading is measured in words per minute. Um, so coming to measuring reading performance, you can either measure speed, like I mentioned in words per minute, that is you ask them to read uh, a sentence or a paragraph, and then you measure the time that they take to read that. And then uh, the reading rate is the total number of words divided by the time, it's, it's simple. Um, and another way of measuring it is reading comprehension. So you can actually re ask them to read the material and then ask them questions at the end of it to understand how much they understood from the material. So that is reading comprehension. Another way of measuring reading is to measure the reading accuracy. So you ask them to read words and then uh, measure the number of mistakes that they made. So that is like counting the number of errors. So those are the three ways to measure. And of these three, uh, what we mostly use in vision science literature is reading speed because uh, reading speed is one measure that is mostly sensitive to changes in vision. So if you are trying to measure reading performance in a child uh, that comes to you, reading speed is mostly the apt measure for you, for you know, optometrists, because uh, reading speed is something that changes with vision and it is a useful measure for us compared to reading comprehension because once the reading development is normal, they don't show much changes in comprehension because there is nothing wrong with them cognitively. Uh, so the comprehension is mostly fine. And usually uh, from uh, research, what we know is that their accuracy is also comparable to children with normal vision. So it's mostly reading speed that you know is, is uh, in focus. So uh, when you actually measure uh, reading speeds, uh, it has a, a very, uh, uh, predictable relationship with print size. So you know uh, there are uh, different types of charts that we use to measure uh, reading. So in, in normal clinic, in private practice, or when you are seeing children, you usually use words, a chart with words in it, or uh, numbers in it uh, to measure their near visual acuity. And then when you have to measure reading, you can either give them words or sentences. And you start with the largest print size and then ask them to keep reading till you know, they can't read. So when you actually uh, measure the speed uh, across different print sizes, 
this is the relationship that you would see. You know, they, they have pretty good rates in the more larger print sizes. And after a certain print size, the reading starts to drop. Uh, and there are specific markers for this. So the print size at which the reading rate starts to drop, that is called the critical print size. It is important for us because that is the smallest print size that they can read with the maximum rate. So um, beyond this, you know that their reading performance is going to drop. So it, it is a very important measure in that sense. And then the smallest print size they can read at all, like you know, of all the print sizes, the smallest print size they can read is uh, the reading equity, like the, uh, the threshold print size. So that is very similar to the near visual equity measure that we get, uh, but it's that it's just that it is you know either in sentences or words. So it is it is from reading measure. So these are the three important measures that you get when you measure reading performance. One is the reading rate. Another one is the print size at which they can read with optimal reading rate, and then the last one is the threshold print size, which is also their reading equity. So. Um, what we know of children with low vision is that children with low vision have reduced reading rates. The maximum reading rates uh, compared to normal, uh, uh, normally sighted children, low vision children have reduced reading rates. And then also their critical print size is much larger compared to children with normal vision, as you can expect, because it is related to equity again. Uh, they need larger print sizes to achieve uh, maximum reading rates. And their reading equity is also much uh, higher compared to children with normal vision. So that is the shift that you would expect. Um, so now, you know, if at all you read, you, you measure reading in the clinic with words or letters, or even suppose you have a chart, you know, the, the most commonly used for reading is the MN read chart, uh, which is developed specifically for measuring reading performance. Um, and then this is the, this measurement that I showed is a typical uh, you know, reading measure that we get from the MN read chart uh, because it has different print sizes and it has uh, sentences, uh, continuous sentences. And uh, when you plot it across different print sizes, this is what you get. And even if you do that, is it similar to what you would get with real world reading? Because now I'm taking it one step further. Uh, in real world, you are not reading because when you measure in the clinic, you ask them to read it aloud because you want to know the errors that they make. And then uh, you want to uh, do short sentences because you don't have all the time in the world. So it is a very short reading task that you give in the clinic. Whereas when you take it to real world, you know that they have to read for longer periods of time. Uh, like I showed, children in the classroom, they spend at least uh, 15 minutes on a continuous uh, uh, period to uh, read longer texts. So that is a requirement that they have. So it's important for us to know whatever we are measuring in the clinic relates to their real world performance. So whether it is reading or any other type of task that we are thinking about where, that we measure, we need to be pretty sure that what we are measuring is relatable to their real world performance because otherwise, uh, whatever you're prescribing or whatever strategies you're working with them may not work with them uh, when they go out into the classrooms or when they go out in the real world. So uh, it, it, it is of no use. So it's important for us to know. So when uh, this is this is part of my thesis, what I did for my PhD, um, I was working on prolonged reading performance in children where um, I assessed silent reading rates in children, uh, which is the most common way of reading normally in real world, because when you read uh, back at home or in, in the classroom, you don't read aloud, you read silently. And which is different from the oral reading, because when you read silently, you're much more faster. Because when you're reading out aloud, you have to spell each word, not spell, you have to pronounce each word. So that takes more time compared to reading silently. So silent reading rates are a little bit higher than oral reading rates. So that is one uh, first difference. And the second thing what we found was that um, uh, their reading rates that you can see, there is a correlation between oral reading and silent reading. But then it is, it is not like one can predict the other. So the correlation was not very strong. It is, it is a small correlation, like about in, in low vision, it was only 39% of the reading rates that uh, you know, they did silently could be predicted by uh, oral reading rates. So what I'm trying to say is that when you measure oral reading rate in the clinic and you get an idea about how they would perform in the real world, 
um, it is it is only an indication. It is not uh, showing you the exact picture. So it might be important for you to spend a little more, bit more time and then do a longer reading task with them. You know, in in one of the sessions, if you are examining these children, you might want to call them back, uh, examine this in multiple sessions. But it is important for for you to evaluate how they do in real world as well. And then prolonged reading task is one of the ways to assess their reading performance in the real world. So uh, that is something to keep in mind. Uh, so this is another uh, 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 plot that I had in my uh, PhD research. So what you can see is that when I measure reading rates for a prolonged reading test, I ask them to read for 30 minutes. Um, these were children who are uh, school age. And then the green is all normal vision children and the red is the low vision kids. So you can see uh, when you look at the reading rates, the low vision children, the reading rates are much lower. And uh, what you also can see is that the reading rates do not change much uh, over a period of time. You know, when you give them a 30 minute test, they are able to uh, keep the same rate. But what you see is that the number of children who dropped out of the task with time. So when you consider the low vision group, by the end of the period, only half of them could maintain that amount of time. So they started to feel more fatigue, you know, midway during the task compared to children with normal vision. So it is a reading duration that showed a difference compared to reading rate. So what the take home is uh, that, you know, they have problems in sustaining reading for longer periods of time, which we are not aware of, because when you give a prescription, you just think that, you know, I mean, their reading equity is good. Uh, they're able to see the letters, but what does that mean to you? I mean. Uh, you have to also see whether they are able to perform a longer task, whether they are able to maintain a task. So these are the important questions that you should have in mind when you when you see these children. And this is another uh, one where we actually ask them about their visual fatigue. So you can see that children with low vision were very, uh, uh, you know, uh, experiencing very higher amount of fatigue compared to children with uh, low vision because midway through the task they were, you know, shooting up high and it remain high throughout the task. So visual fatigue is another aspect you have to take in mind. Um, so that is, that is about reading in general. Now, you know, that is only one aspect of low vision exam. I can go on and on about reading because that is one of the areas that I have worked on. I'm very passionate about it. But then you, you have other performance measures also that are important, um, which are, you know, uh, their hobbies or, you know, other tasks that they do in life as well. So it's important to um, assess other performance measures. And it is very task specific and it's also very child specific. So just like I mentioned about reading itself, uh, where everything is related to what exact uh, task that they're doing, the other performance measures are also related to uh, the task that they do. So it's, it's very goal oriented, uh, it's uh, not generalizable. So what you do with one particular measure is not applicable to other measures. Um, and there is no one size fits all. So you have to assess them based on the task that you are evaluating. And then uh, it's, it is very difficult to like, suppose you are actually uh, assessing them on different tasks that they do in life, like uh, you know any sports or you know, games that they play, or um, you know their interactions, or you know anything you name it. Uh, one of the problems with performance measures is that it's very difficult to standardize it because you know suppose you take visual acuity or reading, you have charts that are being developed for it. You can control the contrast, you can control the lighting, and you know other aspects of it. But when you're measuring performance, how do you control it? Like you know you are evaluating a child based on their performance of doing something in real world, and then you know the uh, environment in which you are evaluating can change because uh, in, in private practice or even in a hospital, it's very hard uh, to have a room dedicated for this purpose. You know, you, you have limited space that you're working with. So to control things and keep it uh, that way for doing performance measures is very hard. So that is why very often you don't get to um, do performance measures. You just measure visual acuity or contrast sensitivity and then, you know, prescribe based on that but it is, it is very important to measure performance as well. So that is where virtual reality comes in uh, because you know, when space is an issue and standardization is an issue, 
uh, virtual reality is a very robust platform where you can actually bring in different uh, variations. Like you can control the lighting, you can change contrast easily, you can manipulate the scenes easily, um, and then it is also accessible. So you can you can take it around. Um, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're sitting in a bus stop to evaluate versus their home versus your clinic. So it's it's very portable and it is also very useful for training and rehab. So, uh, you know, things that are not safe to do in real world. For example, you want to teach them street crossing or mobility or, you know, climbing down the stairs. It's, it's not very advisable to uh, train them in real world because uh, it is it is not safe. Uh, to take them around in, you know, in a busy street to teach them crossing. And so this is one of the areas where virtual reality can be very helpful because uh, safety is, is not an issue there. You can, you can uh, manipulate the scene. You can include as many traffic as you want to, and then, you know, manipulate the settings. So um, this is one thing that is coming up um, in the recent uh, days of the technology. We have like lot of options with virtual reality. There are so many gaming sets uh, that could be easily uh, incorporated into your practice. So uh, currently, what I'm working on is something of, uh, you know, uh, with virtual reality where we are developing performance measures for people with low vision in virtual reality. So um, we are validating a test for that. And there are many, many tests. There is a visual field exam that is available in virtual reality. So this is, this is a coming up thing as well. So coming to the management of low vision. So the first thing is obviously a very good refraction. There is nothing to beat that. Um, so first, first is that. And then, like I mentioned earlier, you, you have certain conditions where you expect certain type of refractive errors. So, uh, you know, that is something to keep in mind as well. Um, and another aspect is, uh, uh, you know, checking the distance prescription and the near prescription. So in the past, uh, magnification was calculated purely based on distance equity. But then in children, um, it is important to do both because they have a reasonably good amount of accommodation and uh, they, they have different needs. One is like their school, uh, they need to see the blackboard, whereas you know they have to also perform near tasks like reading and sustained reading, like I mentioned. So it's important to assess both distance and near. Uh, and compared to adults, children do have distance goals because, you know, suppose a per, you take a person with AMD or other conditions, it's mostly near prescription that we talk about, like they have mostly issues with reading. But in children, uh, you might have to consider the distance goals as well because, you know, they need to have a, a distance prescription and a distance magnification for a Blackboard and other things in uh, school. Um, so when it comes to uh, magnification, so everybody is familiar with the Kestenbaum rule, which is the reciprocal of distance visual equity. So suppose a person is reading um, six by 60 is their distance visual equity. So reciprocal of that is 10. Um, and then 10x is the magnification that you would try on. So that was, that was the guiding uh, rule uh, for most part of low vision exam. That is what we believed in. But then all through this, what I was trying to emphasize was that low vision exam has to be task specific. So you have to evaluate uh, the requirements based on each task. So when it comes to that, it doesn't make sense to prescribe a near magnifier based on distance visual equity, right? I mean, you have to measure near vision and come up with a measure to prescribe for near. Uh, it, it is not ideal to use a distance visual equity to do that. So that is where uh, the term equity reserve comes into the picture. So this is a, a way of, uh, of coming up with a magnification for reading. So what equity reserve means is that it is the ratio between threshold print size and target print size. So we know that when it comes to reading or anything prescribing magnification, uh, it's not advisable to give the maximum magnification so that it covers the entire range of tasks. I mean, like they can read the small print, they can read big print. That's not the case because you know, as you go up in magnification, the field of view comes uh, less and less. So it's not that always more is better. Uh, it is the other way around, minimum for maximum field of view and maximum performance. That is what we need to take into account. So we have to have certain guidelines to come up with the act, uh, actual magnification required. And 
equity reserve is, is that term that will be helpful in determining what is the starting point. So near visual equity, you know, you have near visual equity, like that is something that we measure regularly in clinic. So that is a starting point. And then from there, so um, suppose a person's near visual equity is N8. They are able to read the N8 print size and what they have to read, the target print size in real life, like suppose their requirement is to read newspaper, which is also N8 print. Uh, that means they operate at an equity reserve of zero. They don't have any reserves because their near visual equity or the threshold print that they can read is the same as their target print. This person, when you actually examine and then you give a prescription or with their glasses, they are able to read N8. And then you ask them, you know, what do you normally read? What is, what is your, you know, like uh, normal reading like? And he says like, he or she says like, okay, I mean, I like to read newspaper like every day which is, I don't know how many people read it anymore, but you know, the, this is the ideal example. Um, but yeah, so if that is a goal for this person, reading goal, then that means that, that they're reading with zero equity reserve and they are not comfortable reading the newspaper for a long period of time. They will have issues because what we know is that to continue like with fluent reading speed, you need an equity reserve of at least two and a half times. So the print size that you can actually read should be at least two and a half size smaller than the actual print size that you need to read. So for this person to read the newspaper comfortably, he should be at least be able to read um, N4 or N2 print size comfortably so that he can, he can read the newspaper for long periods of time. So it's, it's sort of like you are having the bank balance, like, you know, so if you are running with zero savings and you know you're meeting day to day needs you are actually stressed out like to you know with your expenses and things so that's easily relatable from real world like you could think about it this is also similar to that so anything like if you don't have enough functional reserves uh, you are operating at your maximum level then you know it it starts to kick off like when you actually read uh, for long periods of time and you know when when you are actually performing a reading task in real world. So um, we have to know these two things. One is the threshold print size and the other one is the target print size. So the threshold print size is just a guiding point. The threshold print size in normal terms is near visual equity. That is what you, know, you measure. And the target print size is the print size they want to read. Okay, so based on these two things, you come up with the magnification amount that, they, that you need to prescribe. That is how you would go about it. So this is a table, uh, this, is, this is a paper that was published. And um, this is a table that shows to give you an idea about what are, what are the different print sizes and how equity reserves would come into the picture. So uh, you know that newspaper print is N8, like you, you have it here. And smaller than that, you come across and, you know, telephone books and things like that, which, which is like obsolete. People hardly use telephone books these days. I don't know who has it. But then just to give you an idea about the different uh, scenarios. Um, so when you talk about equity reserves, um, this, is, this is what it is like. So if a person needs to read newspaper and then their near visual equity is also N8, this is like at the same level, this is zero. To read this print comfortably, you need to at least up their magnification so that they can read N2 print. So that when they read N8, they're reading with, you know, um, four times magnification. So in normal life, uh, you know, pre-press biops, when you take your normal reading speeds at, at 35 to 40 centimeters, naturally we adopt that distance so that we get that amount of equity reserve. So we don't know about it, but that is how we actually keep the reading material. When you ask, a person to keep a reading material and start to read. Naturally, we are inclined to keep it at the distance where it can give us that amount of equity reserve, which we don't know about, we don't think about it, but then that is how a normal person reads. And when it comes to low vision, that is when you start thinking about it because now they're not able to read that material at that distance. And that is when you think about, okay, how much magnification can I give? And that you have to give at least 2.5 to make it similar to a person with normal vision. So that is, that is what it is. Um, another factor that comes into the picture is the equivalent viewing distance. So you know there are different ways to achieve magnification. One is prescribing a plus lens. 
The other way is to actually increase the print size. You actually make it larger. Or another way is to bring the material closer. So these are the different ways. So um, equivalent viewing distance is the distance at which um, you can actually keep uh, the printed material so that it gives a magnification that is equivalent to, or the image size is equivalent to that provided by a plus lens. So for example, what I'm trying to say is, um, you can either give a person a plus 10 lens and then ask them to, um, you, you can either uh, give them a plus 10 lens and ask them to read it at 10 uh, centimeters, or else you can bring the material closer and then use your accommodation and read it at that distance. So both are the same because you are changing the distance and the retinal image size remains the same. Um, so that's another way. And then this is important in children because you see that children with low vision bring materials closer to read compared to adults. Adults are very less tolerant to closer viewing distances because they have very little accommodation. So you obviously think about prescribing plus lenses for adults. Whereas children, when you ask them to read, you, you typically see them bring it closer, like especially children with low vision, you see that because this is what they do to improve the, uh, magn to get the magnification. So um, this is an example. If you're able to read N8 at 40 centimeters to achieve about four times uh, magnification or four is to one equity reserve, then you should be able to read N2 print size so that you are able to read N8 fluently. So you either bring it closer to 10 centimeters or use any device that gives an equivalent viewing distance of 10 centimeters. So you can do these or you can use a combination of these two. Uh, these are the things that you have to keep in mind. So when uh, talking about near working distances, um, these are some of the examples that we can actually look at because in studies, we see that children with low vision read, the most common reading distances is about five to 10 centimeters. They read that close. Whereas you know children with normal vision read at about 30 to 40 centimeters. So if you look at the accommodative demands for these two distances, you can see that for normal vision, it's about two and a half diopters to three diopters. Whereas children with low vision are working with demands like 10 to 20 diopters, which is at least four times more than children with normal vision. Similarly with convergence as well, when you look at those distances, it's about 15 to 18 prisms when you look at normal vision, whereas it's about 60 to 120 prisms when you talk about uh, low vision. So the demands are widely different between children with normal vision and uh, uh, you know, uh, children with low vision. So this is something that you normally don't think about because you think that children have good accommodation and they can actually use that and bring things closer. But even then, when you look at the demands, you know, as an optometrist, this is where you have to think about, you know, prescribing uh, for uh, that distance. So this is huge, too, too high a demand to compensate by just accommodation because it's a, at least four times to, uh, and convergence is even more high. So um, what we know about accommodation in children with low vision is that uh, we know that in uh, juvenile macular degeneration or Down syndrome or in cerebral palsy, they have uh, poorer accommodation. That is something that we already know. Uh, whether we actually think about it when we see these children is different because we still see many of them uh, don't have reading glasses. When you see children with low vision, you don't immediately think about reading glasses because you think about, okay, how can I make them see the blackboard or, you know, like far distances? But reading, uh, you know, they usually read at close distance. So you don't immediately think about accommodation and providing, uh, you know, glasses for that particular working distance. And uh, when you think about other conditions in low vision, it can be expected that they also have reduced accommodation because uh, for accommodation to, uh, you know, uh, take place, you have like four components of accommodation. One is reflex, one is, you know, proximal cues. Like as you bring closer, you're aware of the distance and then you, you have stimulus to accommodation. The other one is virgin. So, you know, when the eyes converge, that is also a stimulus to accommodation. And the fourth one is the resting state, which is a tonic accommodation. So there are four components of accommodation. Of these two, at least two of them are, you know, affected with visual impairment. One is that 
you know, children with visual impairment, they have reduced sensitivity to blur or they could have reduced sensitivity to blur um, compared to children with normal vision. So then, you know, it doesn't have the same amount of uh, reflex accommodation cues compared to children with normal vision. Same thing uh, when it comes to virgins accommodation as well, because they have uh, poorer convergence or they have binocular dysfunctions, then the virgins accommodation is also less. So the two main components of accommodation are not fully functional in, in these children. So you can expect that their accommodation is not functioning normally. So this is something that is very, very important when you prescribe, because even if they can read N6 or N2 or whatever, up, you know, in their close reading distance, it is important to consider reading glasses uh, because it's important for sustained reading. So um, this is what, again, I'm trying to stress here, near additions need to be considered. And then also another thing is when you uh, increase the ad, you have to consider prisms also appropriate for that distance. For example, you pre prescribe a plus eight, you have to give a plus 10, uh, you know, convergence like prisms also in the glasses, that's important. And um, another aspect of it is that when you prescribe uh, hand magnifiers or stand magnifiers or, you know, low vision devices like that, you have to also consider eye-hand coordination because, uh, you know, in, in adults uh, who have just low vision, you don't think about it uh, much because, they have good eye hand coordination or you know it's all well developed skills for them but whereas in children who are born with a visual impairment vision has a huge impact on development of these skills as well so you can't just assume that they have very good eye hand coordination or they can easily manipulate so they might need some training to use these devices so that's another thing you have to keep in mind and also uh, there are other non visual factors like uh, you know that can also be affected because of vision you know they might be less motivated to read because you know it gives them fatigue um, and also you know overall development comes into the picture as well so if if you know the development is not up, the milestones are delayed and things like that uh, it can have an effect on um, how you deal with uh, these prescriptions as well so that is where, uh, you know, another important aspect to consider is uh, integration of different senses. So from early on, it is very important that, uh, you know, it's important to use their vision. There is no doubt about that. But it is also important to teach them to accomplish functional goals through other senses. Like you, you have to engage as many senses as possible from the early days, in addition to training them with vision, uh, because, uh, you know, there are more than one way to achieve a task. So some people might prefer, you know, auditory method for certain tasks versus visual for some other tasks. So it's not like, you know, purely visual, like it's not unimodal, where for everything you, you, you train to them to use vision or for everything it's auditory or, you know, it's, it's not either or, it is a coexisting thing. It's multi-sensory. So that is something that you have to focus on from early uh, days. And uh, like I said, some senses might be easier for certain tasks. So for example, they might use uh, auditory cues for orientation and mobility, and then uh, they might um, use vision for reading because you know, especially when they have a peripheral defect or things like that, they might not be able to navigate themselves easily just by using their vision. But at the same time, they might be having some central vision so they can read print easily. So they are visual for reading, but for orientation and some of the other things, you know, uh, getting into new environments, they might be non-visual. They might be using other cues uh, or they might be trained to use other cues so that they can be safely navigating the environment. So it's important to consider these things as well. And, you know, vision is our part of the job, but then it's also important to tell them about these things so that you can refer them appropriately. So these things are important because uh, as far as their development is concerned, it's important to have as many experiences as possible in the early life so that they can have, you know, their development compared to normal children. So it's multidisciplinary. That is all what it comes to. So optometrists or ophthalmologists is only one part of the puzzle. There are many other people that should be involved in the game. So then one of the main group is the teachers, like, you know, the teachers who work with them or the special educators. Um, at least in the Western world, the children with low vision usually go to normal schools and it's integrated. Education is mostly integrated. And I hope like at least, you know, it's, it's in the coming years, it's happening in India too, where, you know, more and more uh, children are entering mainstream 
at least in some schools, uh, it might be possible. But even otherwise, it's important to keep all the people who are involved in the child's health or you know, in, in the child's training in the loop. So there are other people like occupational therapists. These are the people who would train them with using the devices or you know, certain task specific things like looking at reading per se or anything like, you know, for example, they need uh, help with certain sport activities or anything that the child is interested in. So um, currently it might be that, you know, even now it might happen that uh, if they have mild visual impairment, you know, then you promote the use of vision. But the time they start to have moderate to severe in, uh, you know, impairment, then they're treated like blind children. You know, then they are more into blind rehab. Uh, so it is still happening in the current world also that it is either or. We still don't know like how to deal with this little bit amount of vision. You know, we don't, we don't maximize it fully, but it is really important to do that. And optometrists have a big role in that. So it's important to engage in other uh, you know, therapists when it comes to children so that they can learn these skills. Another uh, group is a speech therapist, like you know, developing language. And uh, this is also important when they have more than one type of sensory defect, like dual sensory impairment, and also orientation and mobility instructors. So especially these uh, groups are important when they have a progressive vision loss. So if you know that they have a condition that then they can cause progressive vision loss, then it is important to talk to them early on and then start to develop you know, these other aspects of training so that you know, they can be independent as they grow up. So these are very important things. And also audiologists. So it's important because when vision is not dominant or vision is not optimal, then they, you know, like I said, you have to develop auditory cues or you know, tactile uh, methods and things like that. So it's important to have audiology exams to make sure they are hearing well you know, they are sensitive and they are able to use that. And also neurologists, depending on like, especially cortical visual impairment and all, you might need imaging and you need other techniques to prove that the child has a problem sometimes because it's not like ocular structures are, uh, you know, uh, dysfunctional or something, you know, their eyes are fine. So how do you know that this child has other neurological issues? So, you know, you it's important to consult with a neurologist sometimes when you don't know what's going on. And also psychologists, because there is a huge emotional aspect to low vision. So it's important to keep them motivated. It's important to have counseling. So they should be also in the loop. And last but not the least, like the most important of all is the children themselves and their parents. So you have to communicate with them as an optometrist of primary care. Um, even if you are not trying to do low vision, it's important to talk to them to actually get them to the right people and to educate them. because you know, there is nothing that prevents this child from having normal development and behaving like a normal person, you know. Uh, the one thing that comes between these two is you probably, you know, because they, ha they haven't gotten this advice from anybody. So it is, it is upon you to tell them uh, the right things and refer them to the right people, even if you don't. I mean, you can refer them to a low vision optometrist if you yourself don't have it in your practice or you're not working in a hospital, which is multidisciplinary. You can develop the circle and do that, which is very, very important. So when it comes to patient communication also, it's important to communicate the right things and you know, letters to the other professionals who are working with them. Because sometimes when a child is undergoing physical therapy or occupational therapy, their vision and their prescription is very important to achieve those goals. Because if a physical therapist is working with them for balance and posture and things like that, you know, other aspects of it, uh, you know, sometimes prism glasses are very important for that because, you know, it helps them in maintaining their body posture and it has a huge effect. So it's important then to advise, uh, you know, the PT to, uh, to the glasses during those sessions because otherwise they're not going to get the maximum benefit out of it. Or even like occupational therapy, like when you don't wear your glasses, it can have an effect. So it's important to communicate about your prescription and, you know, the indications of using each of your prescriptions. Um, in, in different areas, uh, and they also should be knowing about it. And also letters to the school, because the, sometimes the school authorities don't think that the child needs to be seated close to the board or, you know, they need extra accommodation. So it, it should be also important to keep them informed. And uh, family and caretakers, sometimes if it's not immediate family, they have other caretakers, a nurse or anybody who's involved in uh, the care of the child. 
especially like if they have multiple handicaps, then there might be more than one person who's involved. So it's important to keep them also educated about what uh, you know your plan is and what you're thinking about doing for this child. And as always, early intervention is the best. So the earlier you catch them, the easier for you to um, you know follow up and uh, you know make these changes quickly than at a later stage. Uh, when they're developing, it's much more uh, you know much more effective, like to incorporate vision into it. But once they become completely non-visual or you know completely in blind rehab, it's very difficult then at that point to train them into visual strategies because then it's it's like all confusing. So the early you get them, the better. And then at least in the early years or when you start off, it's very important to have frequent follow-ups because their demands are constantly changing. They're growing. They're, uh, you know, as, as the class changes, as the grades go up, um, it's important to keep up with that. You know, the demands are different. You know, the uh, print size they deal with is different because uh, when, uh, you know, you take children's books, like young children, they have larger print. And as they grow older, the print becomes smaller in size. So the prescription needs to change accordingly and things like that. So it's not like you prescribe one 10x magnifier and it works for the next 20 years of their life. It's not like that. So you have to update frequently and you might have to incorporate other technologies into it. So frequent follow-ups are required. So, um, you know, that that is all as far as the presentation is uh, concerned. I mean, I can go on and on. Each of these, uh, you know, like is a one topic by itself. Uh, but I hope I gave you an overview and I'm open to questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Yes. Yes, sir. You can go ahead with the question. Thank you. Thank you, Arti, for the nice presentation. We have some few questions. Mm -hmm. By definition of low vision between 618 to and 3 by 60. Yeah. If so, what to refer children with less than 3 by 60? Can you throw more light on referral criteria? The question um, is from Dr. Yeah, so um, it's it's not like, you know, that visual acuity is just, uh, it's mainly used for actually numbers. You know, when you want to count the number of children who are visually impaired and like prevalence rates and things, that is when actually the visual acuity cutoff becomes very useful. But other than that, you know, visual acuity is just one of the things that you measure. So what what actually uh, you should think about when you're referring is not just visual equity it's about their functional impairment so even if a child is not 3 by 60 you know even if it is 618 or even better vision than that when you see that they have a functional impairment then you should actually think about you know what are the ways to get around that so depending on the type of functional impairment so if it is just something to do with you know some functions like reading or uh, some functions like, uh, you know, contrast sensitivity and things like that, you can actually fix it. Like an optometrist can do it. You know, you can give them specific tins or you can give them higher magnification and things like that. But if it has to do with, you know, other sensory issues uh, that is not functional up to the level, then you have to think about referring them even earlier than three by 60, you know? So that three by 60 is not actually a magic number. Like, you know, you can't go by that. Okay, the moment I see three by 60, I have to start mm -hmm. referring. It's not like that. So that's what I was trying to say. Like it, it is the overall, the big picture. And then you, you have to evaluate the child as a whole and then see where the other people would fit in. And the moment you see that it is, you know, multi-sensory or it needs other rehab, you have to refer at the same time. You don't have to wait till, you know, it gets advanced. Uh, much later. I hope I answered the question. Is that what they were asking or? Karnagaran, sir, you are on mute. Hello. Atman, you can stop sharing the screen. Okay. 
Thank you. Gopinath Madheshwaran, Malki Goshin. Apart from Yemen read chart to check reading rate, speed, and performance, what charts do you suggest in low vision cases in geriatric and pediatric population? Um, so there are other charts that they have uh, developed. You know, the MN read is like individual sentences. It's not like a paragraph or a continuous text. But there are also new charts that are being developed, like iRest, or you know, there are many, many other reading charts that are in use, which has continuous paragraphs and things like that, which allow you to measure continuous, like prolonged reading and all all that. So that is for the adults. But when it comes to children, um, M and read is at the level of grade two. So, you know, it is, it is like very simple sentences. So if at all you are actually trying to do uh, reading with other materials, a few things that you can use is like, you know, even if you don't have like a formal chart to use, uh, the most important criteria should be that you use a material which is much below their reading level. You know, uh, that, is, that is the first and foremost important thing. And the second thing is, uh, you know, the contrast and other things. But uh, you know, uh, these are the important things that you have to consider. But reading charts, there are there are so many. There is like daily lovey uh, reading chart as well. Uh, that is something that is used in the clinic if, if we're looking for clinical exams. But uh, I would like to stress on, you know, prolonged reading tasks as well. You know, that is something that uh, is very, very useful to assess uh, that, that shows you real world performance. So when it comes to that, I rest is one of them. Uh, but otherwise, you can develop your own material, like, you know, any language, but as long as it's within their reading levels, uh, which is like very, very basic kindergarten level, it should work. Thank you, ma'am. Another question is from Pita Ram Prasad. In equity research method, why do we have to consider a target of NVA of N2? While the clinical normal near vision is only N6. Is it the 4x magnification and overestimation? Hello. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm, yeah, I can. So that's a very good question, actually. So, um, equity reserve uh, is, is different from the equity. You know, that is something that you need to understand. So, when you measure near visual acuity, what you are trying to, uh, you know, measure there is that the smallest print size that they can read. Okay. So now, if you remember that reading uh, graph that I showed, when you actually look at reading across a range of print sizes, you can see that they can read at a maximum rate across a range of print sizes. And after a certain print size, it starts to drop. And that print size where the reading rate starts to drop is not the same as their reading equity that you saw, right? The reading equity is much further along. That is the smallest print size that you can read. That is like equivalent to the clinical near visual equity. But the reading starts to drop much before that. You know, at, at that level of equity, they are not reading at their maximum reading speeds. So when you are prescribing reading glasses you know it's called reading glasses right so you're actually yeah. trying to make sure by prescribing that when you give them those glasses they can take home and continue reading and then like i mentioned reading for normal people like you know whenever you mention the term reading that means like you're reading longer text it doesn't mean like you're just looking at a phone number or something like that reading always means that they're reading longer text or story books or newspaper or you know that is what reading term means right so you have to make sure that their reading rates, they're able to read fluently. And to read fluently, you have to actually target a print size much higher than what they can actually read, okay? So that is where it all starts. So now you measure reading uh, equity or near visual equity um, at, at a certain level, okay? And what I was trying to say in that example is that if the reading equity or near visual equity is N8, and the print size, the next important thing is that what is the print size that they would like to read? Suppose your patient has a near visual acuity of N8 and their reading goal is to read some print at N16 or something like that. They're totally fine. You know, you can give like, okay, they are able to read N8 and you're very happy because at home or, you know, their reading needs, they, they're looking at the computer, they can zoom it and they are able to read N16 print very easily. 
So they will read it with no problems. They can read it with you know maximum speeds, very fluently, without any issues. The problem only happens when your equity measure and their target print size is the same. You know, then you are leaving very little margin. Then, then their threshold and the requirement is the same. That means they are not reading at their optimal speeds. They are struggling to read. Uh, you know, they can make it, but not for long. So it will impact their comprehension. It will affect their reading rate. Um, so that is where you have to think about the equity reserve. So N N8 and N2 are just examples, okay? It can be any print size. It all, the two things that you need to know is that what is their equity and what is the print size that they, they need to read. And based on that is what you have to come up with, you know, for the magnification. Thank you. Arti for the wonderful explanation. Another one, any specific method to measure accommodation in low vision children? Uh, any, specific, any specific method to measure accommodation in low vision children? Yeah, that's that's also a very good question because you know, like the print size that we normally use are like the smallest print size they can read, and then you take it closer, you know, the push-up method. So you can actually use that provided you give a proper print size for them, like according to their, uh, you know, equity, you can use that, you know, just a quick estimation. Um, but another way to examine is also the near retinoscopy. So you, you have, like, if you have a retinoscope and then you can actually give them a proper target, uh, which is not like a small letter or something. Again, it, it, would, it would change according to their equity level. So, uh, you know, if you have that near a uh, card that can be attached to the retinoscope, it will have different uh, targets in it. So there are some targets which are designed for people with poorer vision. So if you use the appropriate target, then you can actually measure the lag of accommodation. And then that will also give you an idea about the near prescription that you have to give. Thank you. Another question from Dr. KK. English reading speed can be extrapolated to other language reading speed. Uh, I, I couldn't get your question fully, actually. It was breaking up. Can you tell uh, me again? English reading speed can be extrapolated to other language reading speed. Uh, so, I mean, like when, when you actually... Um, talk about us, you know, English is not our native language, right? But then, you know, yeah. when we are asked to read English, uh, then our reading speeds obviously will be much less compared to a native English speaker for English. So the same thing happens for people, you know, uh, in our language as well. So when we read our native language, uh, depends on how frequently they use it. But because if you ask me to read in my native language now, I haven't read it for a long time. So I might take longer time. So that is different. So, but if you know the language that you're most commonly used to, I think your reading speeds might, will be much higher compared to you know the other language, like the second languages. That is for sure. Um, but if you're comparing, like, uh, so for example, I'm thinking the purpose of that test is to compare, you know, like with uh, prescription or anything. So you're repeatedly measuring using the same chart, then it should be okay, right? Because you're comparing the same person's performance against, you know, uh, the same chart multiple times. So that should be okay. But if you're comparing the reading in English versus their native language, I think there will be a difference and their native language will be a little faster compared to English. Thank you, Arthi. Another question is from Preeta Ramprasad. Will altering the reading distance in between during prolonged reading be effective? So um, another thing is that usually, uh, even when we read normally, like this is not just the case with, uh, uh, you know, low vision, but, you know, the reading distances, um, it, is, it is normally fixed unless like you change the print size, you know, like even during the prolonged reading test. So the reading distances are very much related to the print sizes. So unless like you change the print size, a person doesn't go about changing the reading distance you know, during a task that doesn't happen naturally, unless you instruct people to do so, like, because you think like, you know, okay, that is too far for them. So bring it closer. But when you actually give them a reading material, like anything you, you yourself can test it actually, like you just take a text or any material and give it to somebody to read. They actually automatically, depending on the print size you read, like they will adjust like that. And then 
immediately they'll come to a distance and then that is the reading distance at which they will be able to read that print size comfortably and that is usually fixed you don't change it you know like uh, in between a task so is that the question uh, yes. how about changing yeah so that yeah. is something which is fixed and even when you actually give magnification or anything it it becomes fixed depending on the uh, size of the print that you read another question is from senior optometrist meenat sundaram singara velu will yoked prisms enhance the field of vision what is that sorry will yoked prisms enhance the field of vision uh so it depends actually um you know the i haven't dealt with field expansion in this per se like in this talk but then you 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 have uh, prisms that are being prescribed for different reasons so one one purpose is yes you know it can be used as a field expander um but you know that that is something i haven't covered but yes there is a questions from the chat box so the panel members can you have any questions on the panel members hello dr kk wants to ask some question uh, arthi uh, just i was to think with the newer technology as evolving uh, do you have any newer developments in the pediatric low vision care because one of the challenges is the classrooms suppose i want to see a blackboard or even uh, probably though this a computer age still the blackboards are still existing in many countries is there any newer technologies have evolved um same to do with uh, for that mobility purpose you do have anything specific so uh, one of the things that is currently going on is all about virtual reality and also augmented reality so virtual reality is when you actually have uh, you know certain scenes like that you develop and then you project that screen into the virtual reality headset but the other way is augmented reality where you interact with your actual environment so uh, you know as you as you walk through like you look at certain objects it it interacts with your environment and it can actually uh, you know change the contrast and things like that so augmented reality is something that could be useful in in real environments in uh, you know training as well as you know mobility and things like that because uh, it can you know reading signs or you know looking at specific things it can zoom or um it can change the contrast it can you know change the polarity and things like that so it has a lot of applications so that is something that uh, is being looked into uh, the the one that i am currently uh, working on is a virtual reality based functional vision test so what it does is um it has different scenes based on real life scenarios um so you know for example you you sit in a room you're taken into a room and then you can manipulate the room lighting setting so that you can ask the people whether they can see whether the lights are on or off whether they can see like a you know detergent bottle sitting on the table or not or you know a towel hanging on the wall and then you can change the contrast of these objects as well so that you can see where they stand you know it's it's a way of assessing functional performance and it has also potential for training so i think this is one area where it could be very useful for kids because when you are actually doing vision rehab for them uh to keep them motivated and things like that i mean they are into video games and there is very hard there is hardly any child who actually hasn't used any technology these days like everybody is into smartphones and things like that so there are a lot of things that are being developed that can even like use a smartphone like you know a, a headset that uses a samsung uh, you know mobile phone and then uses it for virtual reality so you don't need like a lot of equipment to actually achieve it so i think the future is into that you know like definitely and i can mention with mobility another uh, good thing about those aspects is that especially with virtual reality it can be uh, used for training without any safety concerns like you know like uh, you know you don't have to worry about them bumping into a wall and hurting themselves or falling off the stairs and things like that so i mean obviously um, at some point you have to get real like you know you have to uh, transfer into real world but it has some potential for training aspect of it when when you are introducing things and when you're trying to uh, get an assessment of their vision and what their visual potential could be and all that i think virtual reality and augmented reality both will have huge uh, 
implications for sure. And it is portable, so it can be done anywhere. That's another advantage because one thing that we see very often is that, you know, most of them don't travel. Like it's very hard for them to uh, travel by themselves and they always need like somebody to bring them to the clinic. So follow-ups become very hard when, you know, you evaluate these people, especially if they are not from the town. So virtual reality is very useful in that sense that you can carry it anywhere and you know you can standardize the settings basically. So it's very, very portable. Thank you. I have one, one more question. Uh, Karnagaran sir, can I? Yes, thank you sir, thank you, please go ahead. Yeah. So the, one other thing is usually it is uh, seen anywhere in the world, whether it's a developed or developing country, uptake of low vision uh, services is very poor. I think uh, if India, uh, no, surface can data shows three percentage, and later on, our data shows uh, even within the hospital setup, number of people entering, hundred. It's only twenty six to twenty seven people uh, getting into the low low vision care itself. Now, what is the present scenario in developed country like yours, and what are the barriers and enablers that you are really looking at, and you are trying to work on those things? Any work, especially on pediatric population. So. Uh... That, that's a very good question, actually. And the problem is actually universal. I mean, I couldn't believe it, actually, because I thought like, okay, I mean, the awareness is much less, you know, when I was in India, I thought like, people don't know about this, that's why. But then it's not that way. It is, it is universal. So I see here also that. Uh, but, you know, not specific to pediatric low vision, actually, because uh, the place I work uh, currently, like at Hopkins, uh, it's a low vision clinic, but they mostly see adult patients. So they're not very, uh, you know, targeting towards pediatric population, although they do have, you know, children coming in as well. But as you can guess, the number of pediatric patients here is, you know, very limited compared to that in India. Uh, so, um, but overall, like in general, the uptake, it is, it is you know, different. Uh, you don't get like a lot of, uh, you know, like you don't get as many referrals as you think that you would. So some of the things that I have seen that they have looked into here is, um, you know, they always talk to the physicians like, uh, you know, ophthalmologists for referral and things like that. And also they're trying to find a system in the medical records where, uh, you know, if, if it is a certain criteria, then it will actually pop up. You know, there is an indication for the ophthalmologist to at that point refer or not refer. You know, so th there is a reminder that comes up saying that, okay, this person, would you like them to refer for low vision or not? So, you know, sometimes I think very often it is a case that they forget to refer. Like, you know, if it is an early condition, especially like, so suppose like a child gets, uh, you know, diagnosed with star guards or something, and then it's not like as severe in, in the younger ages, then at that point he can, you know, somehow get by and not much of a problem in their day-to-day uh, -day life. So then they don't think about referring them. Like somehow, you know, that thought doesn't occur. And then the fact that it is star guards is like, okay, I mean, it's, it's something that I cannot cure. So the usual thing is like, okay, you have this condition and there is nothing that can be done at this point. And then, you know, you can continue with these glasses. You're able to see with these glasses. Okay, continue. And then when you reach a point where you can't see with those glasses, I will refer you to low vision, you know? That's how the mentality is. So I think this is like, uh, I, I think this way it could be a little bit useful. Like, you know, the system, I don't know what you use, you use there, the EMR, but then this is a system that they have developed. This is in trial now. And the low vision clinic is trying out that, you know, a reminder to the ophthalmologist to actually refer or the physicians to refer them. So as soon as it comes to a certain criteria, like, you know, you have the certain ICDs and criteria, it will pop up to mm -hmm. ask. So you have to voluntarily choose that, no, I'm not referring them. So then, you know, it makes you think, right? So that's one way they're trying. So the complete results are not out yet, but then I think it, it looks good so far. Uh, it's, it's a pilot trial that they did. And uh, so far, so good. So I don't know if something like that can be done there too. Just to remind people that the patient could potentially benefit, you know, like a flag that comes up. Thank you. Thank you, Arti. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the panel members? There is one uh, one of our uh, uh, optometrists who is practicing low vision here in Chennai wanted to know the device that you give commonly 
uh, for writing and uh, also she would like to know the any suggestions for trial for trial for writing you mean for writing right yeah for writing well um i think it goes hand in hand with reading like you know when you talk about writing it it is it is you know the other side of the coin right like you have to read what you write so but i don't know if they are referring to patients who have very very low vision and they want something guiding them to write so then you have those non visual devices um uh, i don't know if you heard of them it's called the typoscope so you can use those things to keep them within the line it's tactile so they can feel between the lines and then help with writing so that's one thing that we have always you know uh, had uh but the other thing is you know whatever magnification you work uh with reading you can also use it for writing as well if you are thinking about you know if if they have reasonably good vision but if it's like real uh, low vision or you know in the in the severe visual impairment range then you might need some non visual stuff especially thank for you, signing and all that thank you very much Uh, hello hello thank you sir um, yeah. if there are no questions you can give the thank you note and the launch for the document oh, okay right. uh, thank you arti that was uh, very uh, useful talk and thanks for sharing your own work and uh, hope uh, we can continue to have a lot of uh, you no know, sessions from you uh, so that uh, updated <laughs> information from a developed country to country like us uh, will be very very useful in dealing with patients of course the patients are of different kinds uh, yeah. thank you for that uh, thing i know it's with the, the, the time allowed i think you can't go more in depth and definitely we would be liking interested maybe in a future Uh, sessions with more latest information uh, which you are dealing with i think we are talking about virtual reality things and real life situation how it is really uh, now put to use especially for children i think definitely uh, we will be interesting to interested to listen to uh, thank you for time taking time off and getting up very early Hi. i think i know it is very difficult to get up here <laughs> <laughs> uh uh so that's that's very nice of you and thank you for audience uh, for making it very very lively and uh, no doubt i think our uh, great mc i know him uh, karuna karan is a wonderful mc and made it very lively uh, thank you all and thank you purnima and uh, jyoti bala ji for making mm -hmm. the back screen um, uh, very very wonderful and uh, thank you arti once again and we can thank you so much so before thank we you. complete uh, So we end this session. Uh, OATN is very happy to announce that uh, uh, it has decided that uh, it had developed some uh, clinical recommendation documentation documents. Um, uh, henceforth, at least monthly ones, which will be really useful for private practitioners as well as hospital-based practitioners. I uh, hope all of you remember uh, two months back we had a wonderful session from. Uh, Mr. Gopinath, uh, who is at present uh, the research scholar in Manipal University, and one Mr. Satish Kumar, who is at present uh, faculty in RIO School of Optometry, uh, Chennai. I think they made a wonderful presentation on uh, blue lens, uh, blue cut lenses. I think we all know blue lenses, whether we want to give or not, because all the manufacturer really pushes to go and prescribe for computer uses. and it also says that blue uh, uh, light is very harmful so you have to cut it i think um, our uh, uh, no uh, member mr gopinath he put some effort in developing a wonderful document a one page simple document uh, made basically it was to talk about myths and facts about and recommendation about the blue uh, blocking lenses and um, the document carries some background information it all second component of it talks about the evidences as of today what are the evidences available in relation to the um, you no know, the blue blocking lens and recommendations and oatn recommendations specific for the members 
along with the reference. It is a very scientifically done approach. So I would like um, Mr. Gopinath to tell a few words about the document and uh, therefore we consider that as release. And this will be available in our uh, website uh, maybe from tomorrow. Uh, that's what Jyotipalaji has told. So next, uh, I think every month we will be having one document released. Um, Gopinath, uh, I take the privilege uh, once again congratulating you on behalf of OATN, office bearers and the members. And I, we would like to listen to about the document. Yeah. Can you hear me, sir? Yes. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, a uh, very good evening to all and good morning to Aarti ma'am over there in US. Uh, I, I, I sincerely thank uh, OATN and Dr. Krishna Kumar and Jyoti Balaji sir for motivating me to bring up this uh, particular document on uh, blue, blue light lenses, uh, blue blocking lenses to be precise. Uh, I believe uh, this document will help the uh, optometrist uh, of OATN as well as the uh, other optometrists uh, to enhance their practice in the dispensing skill as well as uh, giving a best practice uh, to their patients and customers. So the, as explained by Dr. KK and uh, this basically explains the uh, what are the common myths on uh, blue blocking lenses, uh, what is the updated uh, evidence on those and recommendations by ABDO that is in Association of British Dispensing Opticians as well as uh, our OATN uh, recommendations, and I hope uh, we we wish to bring up uh, other many other uh, evidences <coughs> on other uh, dispensing calls. And thank you, uh, Gopi. Can you read out the recommendations so that will be the highlight? Yeah, uh, I uh, first of all uh, we need to explain uh, to the patients that uh, there is very less less likely clinical evidences available on. Uh, their uh, available available lenses which uh, they claim to be uh, improving their uh, sleep quality uh, reducing the visual fatigue as well as uh, which pro which protects against from the macular degeneration so we should not claim that to the patients or we should always be aware that saying uh, there are very less likely evidences produced in date and the, another recommendation is we should also emphasize about the blue blocking blue light uh, hazard uh, we should uh, uh, explain them it is uh, more from the ultraviolet that is from sir ocular structures have uh, much more higher uh, um, potential to block those uh, uh, light and always emphasize the 2020-20 rule. Uh, so so these are all the major recommendations which we discussed and brought in. Okay, thank you, thank you, Gopinath, uh, for the thing. And once again. That's a wonderful job and uh, hope the members will read and really implement in their practice. Thank you. Thank you one and all. Um, I leave it to uh, Pungode Madam is there now. Okay, thank you all and uh, thank you Arti once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Thank you all, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.